muted there. How is everyone doing? You guys ready for today? We've got a big day, man. Finance, money. Woo! I have got a big one, big one for you that I am super excited to share on how you can calculate your profit really fast and know every single month and protect your money too. So we got a lot of good stuff. We're kind of going to be talking at a, at a little bit of high level, just, you know, things I've learned. But re remember, like a lot of the stuff that I cover in the book that I wrote with Michael Gerber, E-Myth Real Estate Agent, I actually talk about a lot of the systems and they're simple. They're, they're so simple. Anybody can do it. And uh, so we're going to get into that right away. Before we jump into the material, is there anybody that has anything they want to share, um, what you want to get out of today's session, um, what you're hoping to get out of today's session, so forth? Everybody good? Just ready to go and learn? All right. Is everybody awake today? Let me know you can hear me. Oh, yeah. All yeah. right. All right. Cool, guys. So today, yeah, is about money. Um, I love that we actually talk about this because, you know, if a, a lot of what I have built in the systems that I have in my personal business um, all stem from E-Myth by Michael Gerber, E-M-Y-T-H. Um, well, there it is right there, the E-Myth, E-Myth Revisited. So I implemented that book before probably Keller Williams was, you know, starting and before MREA was even written. And a lot of what I had put in place when MREA came out, um, I had done, but I didn't know what to call it. I mean, Gary was able to label the real estate stuff with it. And that's why we have the E-Myth Real Estate Agent, because the E-Myth is more general and E-Myth Real Estate Agent is taking those E-Myth principles and putting them into the E-Myth or putting, bringing them into the real estate world. So a lot of what you'll see me talk about today is also in, in MREA. Everything that I've done, whether, it's, whether I got it from E-Myth or MREA, they're both the same. They just say I'm a little different. And... Like I said, when MREA came out, when I was reading that book, there was so much that resonated that I was doing right, um, but I didn't know what to call it. And that's where that came from. So anyway, uh, anybody have anything specific they wanna, they're hoping they wanna get out of today's session because I wanna make sure I cover it if we do. Is there anything that struck you with money, finance, anything that you may have experienced in your real estate business so far um, that you wanna make sure we touch on and cover? Maybe it's kind of bouncing out what you spent to promote to uh, market um, the property. Um, you know, what's appropriate? I mean, how much money should you be putting in? Uh, you know, if you're, if you're anticipating a $500,000 sale and, and you've got, you know, $12,000 on a side, twelve five dollars on a side, um, and you're going to net whatever, um, you know, what kind of ratio do you put into that and how much is too much and, you know, Awesome. What's not enough? Nope. That is a great question. And we will actually cover that. There is, we're going to reference the MREA chart of accounts. I don't know why my little spinning window is going here. Uh, we're going to reference the millionaire real estate agent chart of accounts. And just so that you understand the chart of accounts tells you what percentage of your money goes towards what part of your business and know that the MREA really is a research project. There was those 28 million millionaire agents. They, they've all been in business for a long time. That's another way they got to a million is that building that brand. But when Gary got those 28 people together, he basically had them lay out. What do you spend on advertising? What do you spend on gifts? What do you spend on this? What do you spend on that? And what happened was those 28 agents one might have reported something as gifts with that and it had their logo on it, but it was a gift. Another one reported that as advertising because it had their logo on it. And so he was able to take all that information and everybody was calling everything something different. There was really no standard. 
So what he did was he figured out what fit where in that research of writing the book and put that into the MREA chart of accounts. So we will be talking about that. And I'm going to open up the chat window because there is uh, the Keller. There's a website that I'll put in there in a minute. I've got it written down in my notes. I think it's kellerinc.com. Um, and I'll, I'll put it in there when I get there so I can make sure I give you the right site where you can download the actual chart of accounts to look and see what the suggested percentage is. Another thing I want to I want to touch on that so I don't forget Scott and for everybody else is that like let's just say for example it's 10% that goes towards marketing, right? So 10% of your income goes towards marketing if you think you're saving money because you did your numbers at the end of the year and you really calculated your numbers well and you only did 5%, but you had a great year and you increased your business, Gary Keller will tell you that's not necessarily a good thing because we know the return on investment that you get by spending 10%. And if you're holding your dollar accountable to a five to 10 times return, write that one down. Every dollar you spend should bring back five to $10 because there's a ton of stuff out there that bring back two or $3 uh, that you won't necessarily lose money on. But what I'm getting at here is that Gary says that if you don't invest it in the five to $10 and or you save some money, but still did, did well, you probably left a lot of business behind because had you spent the extra 5% on marketing, you might've doubled or tripled that growth. Um, so you have to keep all that stuff in mind when you're looking at your marketing. Now, I, I also want to sp speak to that specifically because if you've got a $500,000 house and then you got a $2 million house, I don't think it necessarily means you spend four times as much marketing on the $2 million house as you do the $500,000 house. What you do is you figure out what gets the most exposure to the property that's going to get the most exposure, the most bang for your buck, right? If you're spending money on getting that exposure. And obviously you have the, the command app and all the technology built in there to get massive internet exposure. So it's really about getting exposure. And, I'll, and all I can do is speak for me personally, and I'm pretty passionate about the marketing side of a property that if, if somebody's doing something special in a $2 million property and they're not doing that in a $250,000 property, that part has never made sense to me. Like if it works, if it really truly sells the $2 million property, then you should probably do it in the $250,000 property, right? So is that money being spent to appease your seller so like you got four times as much to spend, are you gonna hire a professional photographer for a $2 million property and not hire one for a $250,000 property? Uh, it sounds like you're spending money to make your seller happy, not because the professional photography works better on a $2 million home than it does on a $250,000 home. So that is another filter that I want you guys to put on it that you know, if you wanna spend your money on it, that's great. Um, but just tell the seller, you know, that's why you're doing it. You know, I, they're expecting it. You're not really going to get a return. You're just spending that as lost dollars. So I do the exact same thing on a $60,000 house in my market that I do for a $400,000 house, because I only do the marketing stuff that gets massive exposure to their house and helps the property sell, helps the property stay top of mind with the buyer and so forth. So we will get to that chart of accounts. Um, and then obviously if you have any questions about any specifics on marketing and stuff, um, that would, that would be a side call, you know, cause today's call is all about the finance stuff and we want to make sure we get through it. So today's focus is on, on the finance side of your business. Anybody else have anything they want to jump in before I start rolling on the material? You know how I get going. All right, I'm trying to put my PowerPoint back in here. Okay, I'm trying to make sure I see you guys and if you're raising hands or doing anything with your videos. Oh, now I lost it. There we go. All right, cool. So today's about managing money. This is how each commission check is handled and how you can use your money to build your future, build your business, do all that stuff. 
So on perspective, actually, before I even get into that, I just want to kind of open this up and make a couple notes here. Guys, 60 to 80% of all real estate agents end up getting out of the real estate business within three to five years. And a lot of this does stem back to what Michael Gerber wrote 30 years ago, 35 years ago in E-Myth, that most business people, there are technicians, there's managers, and there's the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur is like Gary Keller. He has the vision for where the company's going. The manager is the one that's managing all the stuff, like managing the money coming in. Is it getting a return, tracking your dollars, P&L? And then the technician is the one that goes out and does the work every single day. And so many of you are really a technician in your real estate business. You may not have that manager piece dialed in and you may not have the entrepreneur piece dialed in, but you got a little bit of them because you're trying to think of ways to market and you're, you're tracking your checking checkbook, right? It's like it, it gets money and then you pay bills and then it goes to zero and then you're done spending. And then you have to go get another commission check. So you are, there's some manager part in there, but like in E-Myth, Michael Gerber says that most people are not business owners. They don't have the business sense. And that's why this section's in Ignite to help you guys get a little business sense and how to manage your money like a business owner, right? So the technician, if you were to not come into work for the next month or two months, would you still be making money? And if not, you're a technician in your business. Just be aware of that and know that we need to bring the manager piece and the entrepreneur piece back in. And that's where like the MREA book um, brings us into how to set up the model, how to hire people. I mean, everything. It's the, it's the blueprint to running a successful real estate business. Most of you right now still in the technician role, getting your business built up to where it is producing consistent, persistent business and commission checks right? So you can get ahead of your expenses. You're focused on page 133 through 148 of the MREA. Put that in the notes, page 133 through 148. MREA is the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book. Everybody should have a copy of that. If you don't, go to your office manager front desk and get one. Page 133 through 148 is your critical spot to where you're feeding the database with five connections every single day. Everything that you're learning, everything that you're doing when you leave this session, I hope there's a front, front line layer that you're work, really working on connecting with five people and writing five notes a day. Because if you do that between now and the next 12 months, you will have 1,200 people at five a day. 1,200 people that you've connected with, written a note to, whether or not you're actually doing the follow-up calls or have those plans in place yet is irrelevant. Just connect, write the note, and as you do that every single day, well, if you don't have the plans for the follow-ups afterwards, you'll get them in place pretty quick. Within a month or two, after you get 100 to 200 people in your database, you're going to do it. It's going to happen because you're not just going to keep feeding people at one call and a note. So that part, just know that 60, the, the, the whole thing on the commission dollar and the money that we're talking about today to make that not be as much of an issue and for you to get ahead of your expenses so your checkbook's not zero, the secret is five a day, five connections a day, right? And writing that note. So, um, okay, so this is a pretty detailed screen here. I really like this, this screen here. And if you have your handout, it's in your handout as well. The habits for a financially sound business. I mean, the first one is set a profit goal that funds your big life and pursue the activities to achieve it. Let me break this down for a minute. The, the, the profit goal is really just to be profitable, right? And many of, like in real estate, what I know for a fact is you start out in the hole. So you go to real estate school, yeah, it's probably four or $500, whatever it is in your state. And then you gotta get the MLS key and then you gotta get the MLS access and then you gotta become a national NAR, NAR member. That's 350 something dollars a year. And then you got all these, you got to buy signs, you got to buy all this stuff. And that's the way most people build their business. So you start out in the hole just to get your license and be able to show properties is probably about $2,500. Um, do you guys find that pretty true in your market? Is real estate school around 500 bucks, something like that? Fees and dues around 500 to 1,000. By the time yep. you pay everything, you're probably about $25 in the hole, right? 
-huh. And then if you go to a real estate company that actually doesn't charge, I mean, like they take 50% of everything you make. There are 50, 50 split companies out there and they just throw the phone at you and they don't charge you for your office space and they don't charge you for copies. They are charging you, right? I talk about it in the, the E-Myth real estate agent that a brokerage is still a business. They have to make money. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. You want your market center to make money. You want to pay cap, cap dollars. You do, really. Like I'm not even saying I'm not even an owner of your office. I'm telling you as an agent that was in my office, we wanted to make sure we were paying cap dollars because we're building our business inside this building. And we want the conference rooms. We want the image. We want the sign out front. We want the front desk. We want all that stuff. So in any business, when you're looking at, you know, funding your big life, you want to make sure you're profitable at the end of the day. And that may take a little while to get you out of being behind, but just keep pedaling, 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 keep doing your five a day and you'll get ahead of it. But it also says, and pursue the activities to achieve it. So one of the things that I put in here is you've got your living expenses, and you've got your business expenses. So by the time you pay your living expenses and your business expenses, what's left over is going to be your profit. But that profit is also, if you get enough, if you get some left over after your month to month business expenses and your month to month personal expenses, that's when you can reinvest it into things that will grow your business more. And you're looking for that five to 10 times return. Second thing on here is to estimate and save save for and pay for your taxes on time. Guys, I'm going to tell you this, this one will sneak up and bite you if you haven't done it already. And, and I'm just going to tell you from personal experience, setting up the uh, payroll company like paychecks or an accountant that does payroll is probably the best, smartest thing we ever did because I was a hundred thousand dollars behind in taxes. I may tell you a little bit more about that story later. But we had to get that under control and get get a payment plan set up and get that caught up because there wasn't just one hundred thousand dollars sitting around. And we just weren't business people in the early, early days of my career. So by putting and I believe me, I hate paying for somebody to do my payroll. But the best thing I ever did was pay for somebody to do my payroll, because what I can figure out is what my minimum personal expenses are every single month that are going to be there. If it's a car payment, it's a house payment, your utilities are about this, uh, $200 a month for groceries, whatever it is, you figure out your minimum, set your payroll amount at that without a lot of extra. I mean, if you still want to calculate in a little extra for fun stuff, you can, but understand that if you do your minimum living expenses, because you're going to have expenses now, business expenses on payroll and the other stuff that they process, they, they actually put your taxes away for you and send it in so that you don't get caught in the hole. And here's what I found is that most people can live off whatever check shows up on your desk. Now, most people who are technicians and real estate agents, when the commission check comes in, we put it in our business checking account and then we pay bills until it gets to zero. And sometimes we have new things showing up and there's money in the account. So we buy it and we spend it. And that's what got me in a ton of trouble. So we're going to talk about the accounts here and how to get past that and get your money protected so that you have profit at the end of the month. So then you can say when somebody calls you with a great idea or a marketing piece or it sounds good or they want you to sponsor a, a club. I uh, just had it come up. Oh, a luxury magazine person just called me yesterday. And my, nor my automatic script, write this script down, is I review my marketing budget in October and November. And that is when I determine my marketing dollars for the next year. So obviously today's September. I just said I review my marketing dollars in October and November. So actually September right now, what I told her was, if you can send me that information I will look at it when I'm budgeting next year, right? And then of course she said, yeah, we've got a special through the, the end of this month that's running. It's like, well, I don't review my marketing dollars for next year until October, November. But if you send me the information, um, I'll look at it. Now, if you can guarantee me a 10 times return on, if I give you a dollar today, by the end of the month, I get $10 back. 
know, if your thing's $1,000, I want $10,000 back in 30 days. If you can guarantee me that, that your thing is that good, then I'll put a little priority on it and I'll look at seeing about adding it this month and see if it's in my budget. So can you guarantee a 10 times return? Nobody can guarantee a 10 times return. So the conversation's over, right? Now they can say, well, you really don't pay unless, you know, we only charge you X dollars until you get this or whatever. I, I mean, again, it's you're paying money in. Am I going to get that money back in 30 days? I'm not waiting six months. If it's something like that, I will review my marketing dollars in October and November and see where I'm going to spend that money for 2022. So it gives you time to get off the phone and not make those decisions there, right? Um, okay, so let's see here. What else did I want to say? Be fiscally savvy by reviewing your financials monthly. So there, I mean, here's the thing. When I was coaching for MAPS, we have a PL, we have all the tracking spreadsheets. There's so much to track, 30 lines of your business stuff to track that really, guys, just figure out what the most important thing is that you need to track and track one thing for sure and get that goal. Sometimes there's too much to track. And honestly, I don't know a whole lot of people that actually run their real estate business like a real business and they review their PL profit and loss statement looks like something that you get from an accountant with all the numbers and the columns. I mean, I know that more than 90% of most agents do not actually look at a PL. Does anybody on the group, I want you to unmute yourself if you look at a PL every single week, every week. Right. And the only way to really look at one every week, and I have coaching clients, uh, I didn't think anybody unmuted. I have coaching clients that pay people to provide them with this PL, and it's like $150 a month. But again, if you don't, so they give it to them every single week to review. Well, if you're just looking at it going, okay, looks good, then why are you paying the $150 a month? If you're looking at it and you pull out the MREA chart of accounts that we're going to talk about in a sec, you know, and you're comparing it to see if your percentages are lined up and that you're spending the money you're supposed to be spending and not overspending in an area, that's a different story. That's what a business owner would do, a CEO of a company would do. So you guys want to manage your money like you're a CEO of a company. Pay yourself a salary. I mean, I'm telling you, get that in payroll and make that happen. Oh, Keller Inc., the, the, the uh, chart of accounts, I skipped right over it and I wanted to make sure I didn't skip right over it. It's, it's uh, kellerinc.com. Kellerinc.com is where the chart of accounts is. And it breaks down everything. It's like 10% for marketing. Um, I think it's like 6 or 8% towards salaries. Your two, two biggest expenses in a business are your office expenses and your salaries. So what I suggest on money is if you feel really busy or you feel like you're going to hire somebody, what I would suggest is you set aside the money that you would pay somebody every month. Like, let's just say their salary is going to be $50,000 a year if you had to do that. Or let's say you can get somebody for $30,000 a year. You guys probably can't get anybody for 30. It's probably $50,000 to hire an assistant to do come in, work and do all your paperwork and do all that stuff. So you're going to need to set aside $4,200 to $4,500 in a side account every month for the next three months. This is what I said. This is what I coach to. If somebody needed to hire somebody, I said, great, you're not going to hire anybody for at least three months because I want you to take $4,500 from your commissions and I want you to set them in a side account until you've got three months accumulated, right? And today I would probably do six months, honestly. Um, COVID really is like has changed the whole outlook that three months expenses might not be enough for a major, major shift in the market or a change or like COVID, right? Most businesses didn't survive COVID. So you almost need one year of expenses setting in an account that you could just, if you didn't sell one house for one year, you could pay your salaries, you could pay your, your personal expenses, you could pay your business expenses and stay in business because you're still going to make some money during those times, but you need that money there, right? So now Gary, Gary will tell you it's about a year. 
Um, and it was hard enough just to get three months ahead, let alone being a year ahead, guys. But you got when you're focused on it and it's it's your plan, you just keep selling as fast as you can until you can get three months in there. And then if you take a breather and take take your foot off the gas, you'll start going through your three months pretty quick. And now you're not you got to get to six months or a year. So I always said put three months worth of salaries aside. And if you're about ready to put the fourth month in then, and you still need the person, you can hire them. Now, along with that is you're tweaking your systems that you have in place, if, if you even have any systems, right? That allow you to get time back to be more efficient during those three months so that when you hire that person, you've already got systems that freed you up your time and help you get double your income because you were focused on it, not just running around by the seat of your pants, you know, just like doing things by a whim and then hire somebody and throw them into that. That's like putting fuel in a campfire. It's just going to you know, light up. So get your systems to the point where you get a little more efficient that you can handle everything somewhat by yourself as you're getting busier, replug in more lead generation and more business. So you get even busier, then you're going to be able to pay that person. You're going to be able to bring them on in three months because your systems are tweaked. That's going to make their job more efficient and your job more efficient because you guys have systems that are running the business. So, um, and then prepare now for your uh, financial future. So that is putting money aside. We're going to actually break that down a little bit more. Chapter three and four in the E-Myth Real Estate Agent book, if any of you have it, um, I do talk about um, money and what's income and what's profit, right? Um, when we opened up the first expansion team, now this was before expansion was expansion. It was just Gary Keller had about eight of us in a conference room, uh, and this was probably 20, 15, 20 years ago, uh, maybe 18 years ago, something like that. He had us in a room. He was talking about how agents would be expanding their business around the country and that people could come from the regular work world, come into real estate, and they could look at an agent's business model and go, oh, I like the quarantine model. I think I'm going to buy into that one. And they would actually pay like a fee or a franchise free fee for our systems or the CC cells was one of the other agents that was in there. And so they would just buy, they would buy the model based on how they like to run their business and stuff. And it's almost like we were a franchise within the franchise. And that's been Gary's vision from day one, that it's about the real estate agents. And now real estate agents businesses do look more like brokerages. If you were on mega camp, you would have seen that. So when we, when we expanded our first team from Kansas City, I expanded it to Lincoln, Nebraska. You know, of all places, I should have gone to Naples or like San Diego or something where I would be like in the price range of selling stuff like you guys or New Jersey, right? Where my price points like 800, 900,000 is what I should have done. However, what I wanted to do, I had my brother in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I just wanted to run the model the business systems that we had where all he had to do was feed his five a day. When he got his real estate license, I said, I want you to talk to everybody, you know, I want you to get them in the database and I'll tell you what to do from there. And what we did and this, listen to this. If you guys want to build a real estate business, and if you're going to build a team, or if you've ever been on a team and now you want to build a team, here's what I would suggest. Whatever your split is going to be for your team, whatever you think that is, like there's a lot of teams out there that pay their buyer's agents 50% split, for example. So if you eventually want to have a buyer's agent leverage piece and you're, you're thinking or planning that you should probably pay them 50%, then every time you work with a buyer from today forward, you pay yourself 50%. Do you hear what I'm saying? separate you from your business. Your business is an entity. So if you're going to bring a buyer's agent on and you're thinking 50-50 is the way to go, that's because that's what most people do or whatever, then you, anytime you work with a buyer right now, your business will pay you 50% for working with the buyer and the business is going to keep the other 50%. So I've always challenged anybody that wants to build a team is you better be able to live on the split you have your team on before you have the team live on that split. Or otherwise, you're going to see what we see a lot of times. 
constant turnover all the time because the splits don't work. So, and it's not that 50-50 doesn't work. You have to bring enough value and bring enough business that you could actually live on that 50%. So if you can't make it, then how's your team members gonna make it? And if you can make it, then your team members can't say they can't make it because you've actually done it yourself. That's the difference between a business owner that's tracking things versus just somebody out there winging it. But in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, listen to this. So I live by what I teach. So I told Jason, you get 50% of the commissions when you work with a buyer and you get 20% of the commission when you work with a listing. Because see, listings, like Scott was just saying, when you market a listing, you're spending money to market the listing. There's money being spent and you have the same office expenses on top of working with a buyer. You may not have, you might've spent money on buying the lead or something, but if it's just coming off sign calls, ad calls, you're leveraging command and you're getting the marketing piece in there. That's not really costing you anything, 10 bucks a month. It's not even worth calculating, right? So that's in your, your Keller Williams tech, tech fee is paying for that stuff. So you're going to have more expenses on the listing side and listings are way easier to do than buyers, right? You go in for the listing presentation, you list it, and then usually you hand it off, sign goes in the yard, and then the marketing goes in, or you put it on MLS, it goes out, you get all the marketing in place. I told you guys, it takes me one hour to put our entire marketing plan in place and I'm done. So I've got two hours invested in getting a listing on the market. I might have four hours or maybe six hours showing a buyer three properties to five properties and writing the property and then calling the lender, verifying the approval, you know, all that, getting the inspection done. Now, as you build a big team, you're going to have more people in there, but those expenses will go up because you're paying more people to do those things. So there's more profit in the buyer side for that to be a 50% split. But you don't, re you really can't pay a listing specialist fifty percent. That's way too much for the amount of work that they do. So again, twenty percent and fifty percent, and that's what he had to live on. What we did was the re that other side of the money went into the corn team Lincoln Nebraska pot, and that's what we built our business on. So for the first six months, it's when you hear red light, green light. We were on red light. We were, I really wanted to prove that you could start a real estate business where you could make $100,000, $150,000 a year. He sold around 20 something homes a year, pretty consistently. He didn't listen to his brother to get to a hundred. He didn't, he didn't use the system and he wouldn't plug the people in every day. So he did his normal 20, 20 something sales a year for 10 years. And he bought a house and he paid off his debt and he did all that great stuff, but he didn't build it to a big, big business, right? But what happened was I said, borrow signs from the office. Your office will provide you a sign. You don't need a logoed sign yet. You don't have a brand. There is no corn team brand. There is no Jason Realtor brand in Lincoln, Nebraska yet. So just get a generic sign for the first five or six listings that we get and put it in the yard. Yeah, you know I mean, we're just going to use the Keller Williams brand. And we accumulated the money on those sales by 50% was most of it, or 80% on the listings, 50% on the buyers, until we had enough money to buy 10 signs. And then we bought 10 logo corn team signs, corn team Lincoln, Nebraska, right? And then we built it up again to where we had enough money to then buy an ad in the magazine because we knew how to capture buyers off of that ad. And we were getting a better than five times return on our ads to capture buyers. So what we did was built that money up in the corn team account and he was living off of the split. Now, eventually what he did was he quit putting money in the corn team account and he started keeping the check and that's what toasted him, if you wanna ask my opinion. I mean, he did it for 10 years and he made good money and paid off his house and all that stuff. So, hey, I, I, he's, he did well, but he quit putting money. He, he, he all of a sudden just started taking all the commission checks to get more paid off and to get ahead and didn't put anything back into the business. So eventually he just became an average agent selling 20 homes a year. Any questions? Okay, money is good for the good you can do for it. So again, guys, when, you, when you're starting this real estate business, what Gary has always said is real estate, you can make as much money as you can imagine. I mean, it's hard to make more than you can imagine. So that's why you think big, go big, 
you know, have a big life, have big goals. That's why we do the checkbook exercise in bold where you deposit a thousand dollars and then you spend it. And as soon as you're done, you deposit $2,000 and spend it. Then you double it again and deposit $4,000 and spend it. Then you double it again and put $8,000 in once it's all spent. And you don't just give the money away, you're spending it on things that are popping into your head. And you just keep doing that. I mean, you go from 8,000 to 16 to 32 to 64, and you start spending some big dollars. That is one of, that's my favorite exercise to get me to get way out there and start thinking of stuff. Cause when you're putting, you know, 500, 600 and a million dollars in your account, it's like, that's big money. What would you do with it? Would you start a foundation? Would you do whatever? So real estate is the vehicle to do whatever you want to do in life. It's not to be stuck in real estate, selling real estate, doing the hamster wheel. It's to pay things off, to get things, get ahead. Um, this year for us, you know, we bought a, we've got the lake house, we've got the toys, we got everything in place so we can enjoy this COVID world we're in and have some enjoyment out of life, out of our lake house. But we just bought a condo in downtown Kansas City. It's at the shopping district, the outdoor high-end shopping district that we'll be able to stay in a few days a week and probably Airbnb it and turn it into cash. Uh, I mean, it's just using real estate to build a lifestyle to provide great things for your family. That's what you wanna to get to. I, and I know some of you are still at that starting point and the commission checks go into the checking account and they get spent before you finish paying your bills. I know that happens. So we're gonna talk about how you do that. Actually, we're gonna talk about that right now. On this next slide. So here's, here's kind of an example of a scenario of uh, an agent, a solo agent, where she closes a home and shares the commission at 9,000. Her commission is nine grand, right? So this kind of breaks down the two different scenarios where um, she sells, she gets $9,000. So after company dollars, she gets 5760 that she puts in her bank account and she spends it, right? The second scenario is where she gets the $9,000. She gets the $57.60, but she puts $17.28 in her business account and $4,032 in her personal account. And then out of her personal account, she sets aside her taxes that she'll have to pay and she puts in her wallet what she can spend. Out of her tax side, she's paying state and federal taxes. So guys, I'm going to write this down. This is this is what I talk about in the money section, chapter three and four. Three, Gerber talks about money from an e-myth perspective. And chapter four, I talk about just how I track my money and the ROI and getting a five to 10 times return. But it's as simple as this. You're going to set up two business accounts and two personal accounts at your bank. So you're going to have four accounts at your bank. I don't even care what the accounts are. Whatever account is free. If they have free checking, you're going to set up four checking accounts, but you're not going to get checkbooks for two of them, right? And I learned this from going to FSO, it's Franchise Systems Orientation at Keller Williams. And another suggestion, they still have FSO going on all the time. Man, if you want to run your business like a Keller Williams business that has profit sharing, watches profit, has expenses down as low as possible, makes the business as profitable as possible, as fast as possible, because you understand that us being a profit sharing company, like Gary Keller's, this company had to be so detailed that you can't just throw all kinds of expenses in there. Like you're, when you're looking at your real estate business, you're putting everything you can in there to claim on your taxes. But when you're running a market center, there's an above the line expenses and below the line expenses. Below the line expenses are things where your market center, um, the owner might buy a boat, right? A Keller Williams, you know, the, the Keller Williams boat from the profit that they got from their real estate office. Now they might use that to take the agents in the office out on the water and go have fun and do all that stuff. And the owner just bought it and they own it. That, even though it's a business expense for them, it's, it's below the line at Keller Williams. The profit on the Keller Williams office gets all that profit gets split in half, basically. I mean, there's more to it than that. 
but it's a roughly half that half goes to the owner and half goes back to the agents and gets sent out in profit sharing checks, right? That boat would have to come off of his side of his, that his or her profit, not out of the office's profit, even though they might be using it totally for everybody at the office. I think you guys, Mary Beth said, you guys have an office. One of your offices is open up right by the water, right? So that's what made me think of that boat thing. So anyway, when you are setting up your account, you have a capital account and you have a checking account. Now they might both be checking accounts, okay? But the capital account is the account number. I do not have any checks for this, okay? No checkbooks. I Every single commission dollar that comes in, the whole entire check goes into my capital account, right? So I'll just accumulate my, com my commission checks in there as they're coming in. And then really, like, think about your business like your home. You pay bills a couple times a month on the 1st and the 15th. So basically, I'm going to withdraw out of this account two times a month on the 1st and the 15th. So when the first rolls around, I'll add up my bills that are sitting on my desk for business expenses, right? And I will withdraw that amount and put it in my business checking account, and then I'll pay my bills. It's almost like you want that to almost be zero every single month with just a slush fund if you have automatic things that are withdrawn, whatever. And remember, the money that you're going to bring home on this example where she put that money in her personal account. Whatever you're paying yourself, so you're going to pay your bills first. Whatever's left over in the capital account that goes to your personal account, you, you transfer it to your business account, checking account. You write a check to yourself and then put it in your personal capital account. So now you got a nut, two more accounts. You got your capital account and your checking account for personal. Or think of it like savings and your checking account. So pay yourself from your business into your capital account or your savings account, and then figure out what bills you have due at home and take that amount out and put it in your checkbook and don't put any more in there, right? So if I'm transferring my money through the process, because then I can see in my personal account, whatever I'm depositing, that's the total money I paid myself every year from my business. That's how much I made. The business expense will show your total commissions in, your checking account will show your total expenses. And if there's money left over, you have profit, right? If you're moving this money around and this capital account keeps going to zero and there's not enough there, right? Then you're not profitable yet. But every month that you do that, that your capital accounts are zero all the way through means you got to kick it into gear and get those five people a day in. You got to get that thing going. All right, let me pause there for a second and just give you guys a chance to unmute yourself if you have any questions about those account, those four accounts. Capital business, capital check, personal capital, personal check. That's pretty basic. Where do you pay your taxes from or your, your self-employment? Is that coming from your business check or is that after you go into your house? I mean, well, so I do have an accountant that does a lot of stuff because I hate that stuff, Scott. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Um, I will, I mean, I get screwed up on that stuff all the time if I try to understand it. So I just let my accountant handle it all. Mm -hmm. She'll, so what she does is I'm set up on payroll. So commission checks come in last month, let's just say $20,000. There's an example actually in the book I'll show you. So on here, there was, there's $20,000 sitting in my capital account and there's $2,000 in my person or my business checking account because that's what I need to pay the bills, right? So I even had a payroll account that I set up that my accountant would tell me how much payroll was coming out because I've got my part-time assistant and myself. And for myself, I know what my minimum monthly expenses will always be. Like I've just added up my car payment, my house payment, all that stuff. I know what comes in on the first. I know what comes in on the 15th, my total, my budget, if you want to call it, right? So there's my budget. And I set my personal payroll to just pay my budget so that I don't really get a whole lot of extra. If Because my business, if it's profitable, I can still pay myself a bonus, pay it to my business checking account and bonus myself out $2,000 to go on a trip or to buy a jet ski or to do whatever. 
but my payroll amount is set to pay off all my bills every single month. That's all I want to put in my business account is to almost get my personal checking account to zero every single month. So out of that, so let's just say if it's $4,000, she's taking 5,500 out of my business account to pay for the 40, I'll get the 4,000 and 1,500 goes to all the taxes, self-employment tax, all that other stuff. So that I don't even know where it goes, but it stinks because it's like, okay, I got to have 5,500 in there to get 4,000. That's what you're looking at in this example. The $4,032 is, is the actual paycheck paying myself as a payroll employee. The rest of it went into the business account. And, you know, understand too, that after I do that transaction, there's also still that transaction to cover my business expenses. If you have monthly things coming out. So your cap dollars and your, your um, um, franchise fees are coming out off the top of the commission. So that's not even factored in here, really, even though it's part of your business expenses. Did that answer your question okay? Yep. Okay. Yeah, cool. it did. It did. All right. Um, I know this, but hopefully, hopefully this is at least I'm helping you understand it a little bit. I don't expect you guys to master this, but it's money. It's never fun to talk about this detailed financial stuff. So, um, okay, so financially sound. One transaction, $9,000. The net payment is $57.60 with $24.19 in your pocket at the end of the day. The MREA model shows 60% expenses, 40% profit. I will tell you that there aren't many people at all in the company that are all that are netting 40 percent profit and i only say that because i you know in the in the mastermind rooms with the mega agents and the millionaire agents uh tony decello once he probably had about six or eight hundred of us in a room and he just threw the question out there he goes so who really knows their numbers and is is profiting 40 percent and I think either no one raised their hand or one person raised their hand. I'm not sure who it was. It might have, and they might have been like at a two or three or four million dollar, whatever. But really, most agents are probably profiting, at least the ones I coach are probably profiting somewhere around 18 to 20. What did I write on here? 18 to 23 to 25 percent. It's 28 percent. That's what it is. 18 to 28 percent. In fact, talking to brokers that own brokerages, they have a 4% profit margin, 4% profit margin, because they're just keeping a little, little piece off the top and they're hoping there's enough transactions in there to cover all the expenses. And it's usually pretty darn close. And also because they spend money to make a nicer office, to upgrade computer systems, to make the agents happy. And most agents aren't selling more than four to five to six homes a year. So that's where Keller Williams has a great model with the cap structure. It, the capping, so like once you cap out, I know we saw, I was in um, the Tenafly office team meeting and watching the agents that have capped now. So they're getting 100% of their commissions now, right? If you're gonna do that, you have to bring more agents in to pick up the difference of what they're not collecting from you. See, when I was at the other company, Remax, even though I was on a 95-5 split, the 5% never stopped. So no matter how successful I got, at one point I was paying in 60 grand a year to Remax because I was a top agent and they never stopped collecting. Even though it was only 5%, that added up, right? So just to walk out the door and come to Keller Williams, I put 40 grand in my pocket. Guys, that was like college for my daughter. And I got to cap and keep 100%, which put 40 grand in my pocket if I did the same sales, which I did. I did more sales, actually. So I actually made more money by leaving that 95-5 split and coming to a 70-30 split that capped. So, and again, keep in mind too, these cap dollars, you want the office to get it because you're building a business under this building, in this building, under that brand, you want them to be there. So anytime, I mean, I know we were one of the head turners and we had gotten a special deal and we were part owner and all that little break on our cap or something. And when we understood this, we totally said, we need to pay in our full cap. I mean, we need to pay our share because 
if we build this business and then we cut corners and they are not profitable, they shut the doors and now we have to go move our business somewhere else. So anyway, um, let me see here. And feel free to jump in, guys. I know it's finance and money, so I want to make sure that you guys get all this stuff. So this kind of breaks down through the MREA model if you're on your gross commissions where 30% goes to cost of sale, 30% goes to your operating expenses, and you're working for 40% net income profit. The only way you're ever going to get to 40% is to stick to the MREA chart of accounts. Kellerinc.com has that account breaks down everything. And that's the only way you're going to get there, one. And two, if you're doing your five a day and you're actually following the MREA model to get to 300 sales, like you have to, you have to gross $2.2 million in commissions to net $1 million in commissions, right? So there's going to be $1.2 million spent on your business just to get the million dollar profit. There aren't too many people that are at a million. I, I, we have a millionaire agent in our office, and I will tell you that he probably generates $3 million of gross commissions, and I think he just is at $1.2 million is his pure profit. So if it's 2.2, he's a million higher, but he's just now at what he should be at a 40% profit. So he's operating at about 30% profit, but that's big business, right? Big, big business. So the idea is to drive that 40% to the bottom line. I already said, I see people more probably around the 18 to 23% because we all suck with our money. We're not money managers. We're not you know, investing in a five to 10 times return we're investing in things that are a one-time return or, you know, just so we don't lose money. Um, so you've got to really, really track your dollars if you want to get to the 40%. Um, I already told you the Lincoln story, how we started with $0 out of pocket. We separated me from the business or Jason from the business and Jason worked for the business. The business got the commissions and then paid him his split, right? And if it doesn't, if it's not working, then you got to figure out how do we adjust that to make it work to where the business can stay in business and you can still make enough money to live. And, and again, it could be, you just need more sales too, right? So just the flow of money covering how this guy goes, when you look at the flow of money, um, how much money do you want at your, at the end of the year? So a lot of people will look at their income they want, and then they try to pay their expenses out of it and pray that there's some profit at the end. Guys, right now is the time to turn this around and figure out what you would like to have profit, what you'd like left over at the end of the year, and work into your expenses, what you're spending on expenses to tell you how much income you need. And that will tell you. Now, listen, I coach to this all the time. And somebody says, well, had an off month. I didn't get my four closings that I needed. And I'm like, okay, so next month, you're not going to do four, you're going to do six, right? Yeah, we'll make it up next month. Okay, so next month, they get four, we're still two behind, or they get three, now we're three behind. And it's like, you know, at that point, you need to go into your expenses and figure out what you're cutting out, or go into your income and figure out what you're not going to pay, what you're not going to do, what, what, if you're going to cancel cable TV, because the profit has to at least be zero or higher at the end of the year, or you're upside down or living off of credit cards. So work it backwards, figure out, I would like to put aside $25,000 at the end of the year. What are my expenses right now? What am I spending? And you watch those expenses. So you add those two together and then your income, what you need to, what you need to pay your bills and live off of, that'll tell you the total amount of net money you need coming in that you can divide by what your average commission check is to figure out how many sales you have to have. The number is the number. You have to hit the number. You take that number, you divide it by 12, and that's what you have to do every single month, right? You just have to, or else you have to cut out expenses or cut out income or have no profit. You get to decide which way you want that to go. Um, now, here's what I, here's one thing I want to give you guys. Um, make sure we have enough time. Yeah, we have enough time to get through everything. Make a list, like think of a spreadsheet and make a column for everything that you pay for, right? 
Um, if you're paying for leads, if you've got a newsletter, if you do a postcard campaign, if you have something like send out cards, uh, anything that you pay for, put in the first column. Now, the next two columns, and I'm talking about programs too. If you bought like a for sale by owner program from somebody and you paid $500 for the program, or you're paying monthly to be in a coaching thing, whatever it might be, put one column is if you paid up front for it. So look in your whole office. This is called your inventory list. If you have any kind of programs that you paid for in the past and they're sitting on your shelf and you haven't done anything with them, there's FISBO programs out there. There's expired programs out there. I have my coaching clients write that down. So if they paid for it, what they pay for it? It's paid in full. It was a one-time thing. I got it and I own it, right? Or the second column is I'm paying monthly for it. Now, you might have a third column there because if you're in a contract and you got to pay that monthly amount for a certain amount of time, you might write in there how many more months you have left in your contract because that will tell you what your total investment is going to be. And maybe there's a cancellation fee that you're going to figure out that um, you might not just have you might just have to pay the cancellation fee and get out of it based on here's the total amount I'll pay in through my commitment. And because the last column is write down how many deals you have actually closed from each of those things. Like close commission dollars that you got a return by doing that plan. Like if I had a FISBO plan and I look, two of my for sale by owners last year literally came out of that program. So I would have made $18,000 in the example we've been using from that commission. Right. And my net on that was probably to the business was probably like four thousand dollars, three thousand dollars, something like that, because I had income in there and everything else. So I paid. Five hundred ninety five dollars for the business to make three thousand dollars. So roughly five hundred divided into three is what? Six got six times my money. That's a good program. I can keep that one. But if I have a program that I paid for that's been sitting on my shelf, never did anything with it, and I'm paying monthly for it, and I've gotten no dollars, you have two decisions. Either start a plan to use it now and recoup the money that you've lost already, right? So you could be buying a FISBO phone list. You could be buying an expired phone list, any of that kind of stuff. If you haven't gotten done anything yet, you either decide right now to get a return of five to 10 times on it. I'm going to focus on it, set up a system to cash in on it. Or you cancel the dang thing and forget about it until you come up with a plan to get a five to 10 times return, go back and buy it later. And you might've got a show special or some discount for doing it on the special day. Who cares? Pay full price for it. I don't care if I pay full price for anything over a show special. I just need to have a plan in place to get a five to 10 times return from it before I sign up for it. So if now I'm paying $200 more, then I just really have to get one extra sale more, right? So I just have to have a plan in place to get my return on investment. So evaluate your stuff for a five to 10 times return. Um, here, uh, you know, just looking at this, you know, the income is gonna come from your listings, your sales, your referrals. And if you do any leases at all, those are the income sources. You also, if you get systems in place, you might build some side businesses that bring in business too, like buying, buying a really, really good deal and flipping it and making a profit or turning it into an Airbnb or turning it into a rental. So there are, these can lead to other income sources when you're following the seven, seven levels of the millionaire real estate agent. And then Gary teaches us to build five more businesses. So the way I kind of set that up when I read the MREA book is, I wanted five businesses that, that net $250,000 a year. Five businesses that net $250,000 a year puts me at 1.25 million. If one or two of those businesses isn't doing well, I'm still getting somewhere around a million dollars. Now I'm by no means there yet, right? My real estate business is $250,000. I've got three or four other things, but they're like around 50, they're around 60, um, one's at 120. So I'm not at 250 yet. So I'm not a millionaire yet. Sorry, guys. Um, you just got to keep working, right? Keep doing it smart, though. I'm really not at risk for a lot of money. I don't have a lot of expenses going out because I set up systems to do that. But there's opportunities for joint ventures and the new stuff that if you were at Mega Camp and attended that, you can start making money by having 
technically kind of your own insurance company, your own um, title company, your own mortgage company, and you're making money on those revenue streams as well, because you're already sending that business to somebody. There's more coming out on that, but that is going to be something that's huge. And it's all driven by Gary back to the agent. I mean, Gary works for us. Gary Keller works for us. Gary Keller, he did step back in and he's running Keller Williams, but he works for the real estate agent, not the broker, right? Um, and of course, if he's working for us, then he, then that's going to make the brokerage grow. Anybody have any questions? Jump in if you do. All right, so see if anybody, okay. And, and just cost of sale is that commissions and stuff that you pay back in your, your uh, cap dollars, all that stuff. Um, I love how they were talking about just on your market center cap. No, page nine of your workbook has, do you guys know, is your cap all the same? I had sent Mary Beth a, a message and I didn't know if anybody knew. Well, it, are the offices caps all the same or are they different? That's the first question. Does anybody know? They're different. They're huh? different. They're different. Do you know what your cap is? And if you don't know what cap is or you don't know what I'm talking about, I want every one of you to go to your team leader and get your cap. And page nine in your handout guide, I want you to write that in there. That's the money that's going to the market center to provide the front desk and the conference rooms and the, all that stuff. The great news is, is that if you're starting out or you, you don't have a good consistent flow of business yet, whatever it is, if it's 25,000, 30,000, 35,000, you're not going to pay it all at once. You don't even have to pay the whole thing at the end of the year, even though they kind of need that money to pay for everything. You're going to pay as you go until you cap. Once you cap, you've done your share and now you get to keep 100%. So you want to plug those numbers in and don't look at them as a bad thing. They're a great thing. You can look at what your cap dollars is to your office and what your Franchise fee is six thousand for everybody, or is it three thousand? Three thousand for everybody. What am I saying? Six thousand. Three thousand for everybody. Once you pay in three thousand, just so you know, fifteen hundred goes to your region. Fifteen hundred goes to international. So your region gets some, a chunk of money to bring value back to us, the agents in our regions. The company gets more, but that's what grows the company and provides all the stuff that Gary Keller provides. Uh, above and beyond our $10 into the tech fee and all that other stuff. So that's their income is that royalty fee. But once you pay that in, then you're at 100% and you're done for the year. So those things all help the company grow. Um, and just understand that if you aren't selling anything, you are using an office, you have a front desk person answering the phone, you have a place where your business mail is coming, you have an image and you haven't paid a dollar for it. So you only pay if you have sales. So a lot of times when I say, you wanna double your business, double zero is still zero. <laughs> so be careful on that. Um, but anyway, you guys really wanna plug this in. This is kind of digging into your numbers when you're plugging this stuff in. Oop. You put in your, your total commissions minus your cap dollars. Now, what I would do here is make this column, that top column, make about 15 of those so that every commission dollar you get, write it in there, take it times 30%, write that in the second box, take that commission times 6%, write it in the third box, and then put your net. And then take third, whatever your cap dollar is minus that amount that you have in the second box and just write the balance right below it. Now the next line, your next commission check you get, do the 30%, do the 6%, subtract it from the balance left until you watch that get to zero and have that sitting up on your wall with 15, is about 15 to 17 sales and you're capped out. It might even be different in your market. So you can watch that coming back down to where your royalties disappearing and your cap dollars are disappearing. And then you get to put your commission dollar in the front column. And that's what you keep. And that's really fun to watch. So, um, I think that's really about it. Make sure I didn't have any other notes here. Yeah, that's that's really about it. Um, so working, actually this screen does show you in, in your book, you do have a screen where it kind of shows you how to work your numbers on if, you, if your net profit goal is 100,000, your gross 
profit goal needs to be 166 because you've got 60% expenses, 30% cost of sale, 30% um, just business expenses. So your gross commission has got to be 416. It gives you the formula here, which is 56 transactions, I think is what they're saying, 56 transactions. So you're going to pay in $23,000 between your company dollar. You write your company dollar and your royalty in there, and that will show you what your profit is. It'll also show you what your budget is for what you need to spend. So you asked about that earlier, Scott, on where's the budget. It's 124,000 is this budget. So now you can go back to the chart of accounts and take the percentages of that to figure out where that, how much money you're actually gonna spend in those. So guys, this is, I mean, it's just a recap, just get clarity on your big life. What, what do you guys want this business to be a, a, a wheelhouse for? or the driving thing for, you know, so get your personal and your business budgets figured out. So you know how much to take out of that capital account on the first and the 15th. I mean, just take them off your desk and add them up and then tr transfer the money and pay the bills. Um, just like an office runs. Um, those additional bank accounts that I talked about for your taxes, expenses, that kind of stuff, capital account, checking account, and then maybe one other one for taxes. Um, hiring a CPA is probably the best thing you can do to get your money set aside so you do not run into tax troubles. Do you know that on at Mega Camp, one of the agents they interviewed, couple of things. One had been behind on taxes, $100,000 or more in taxes might've been that they had to get straightened out because they hadn't done that. Another one talked about being embezzled. So in your capital account, if you're the only one that has access to the capital account, your business checking account could have an administrative person who's paying the bills and doing all that stuff, but they have to, they don't have access to the capital account. That, that gal got ripped off for about 80 grand, I think she said, uh, by the time her and her husband figured out that the money wasn't working out and the money wasn't in the account. I know way too many agents that have had assistance, just their admin people stealing out of their capital accounts or their money accounts, right? So you're the only one that releases that money. So anytime they tell you money needs to go in there and it's different from what it was last month, you need to know why. Why is there a variance? Why do we have, show me where this is, right? Um, so that's a way to cut down on that. All right, so that is about it. Uh, where are we? Probably a couple minutes after, like usual. Yep, eight minutes after. Is this good stuff for you guys? Give you a little different perspective on money? Are you glad you showed up today? It's a good framework, definitely a good framework to put my head into, uh, you know, keeping things in different buckets and make keeping things separate and tracking them. So really good. Yeah. Even if you're going to use a PL, man, I'm telling you, capital account, operating account or checking account, right? That's how Keller Williams offices work. They still have a PL, they still do all that stuff. I hate those kind of things. I mean, I just know if there's money left over in this account, I have profit. <laughs> And if you wanted to even do like a profit sharing account to a team, maybe down the road, if you're thinking about that, that's where we would pay our profit out of. It'd be real easy to go, okay, I give half of my profit every month back to my agents and figure out how I'm divvying it all out. And I still have half the profit there that I would move over to my savings account on my personal side, right? Or I reinvest it back into the business, how, whatever I want to do with that profit in my business. So great class today. I, I, I really wanted to share, keep it simple on the accounts, um, operating account and capital account or capital account and operating account. Those are the two accounts that you want. All right, guys, we Friday's our last session. So uh, we will be restarting again on September 20th. I hope to see many of you coming back through again because it won't be the same, but it will kind of be the same, but you'll hear it differently every time you attend. In fact, you attend this as we go through, let's just say January, February, March of next year, you're going through it for the fourth time. You will hear a whole different Ignite class, even though I really won't be saying a whole lot different. All right. Might be sharing a different story here and there, but tomorrow will be the finish of our first round. And I congratulate all of you guys for showing up and attending. We'll see you on Friday. 10.30. 10.30. See you then. Have a great one. Thank you.